<laughs> Wake up. Well, we have a lot, you know, the whole new record playing in Moscow. You've got a tour coming up. We've got 30 minutes, a lot happening. Let's get right to the phone calls. Shane is calling from Poughkeepsie, New York. Welcome to the show, Shane. And ask your question. Hey, guys, what's up? Shane. Hey, how you doing, man? Hey, what's up? We play Poughkeepsie, Mid Hudson. You guys are excellent, dude. I gotta tell you, man, you guys rule. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I'm just wondering, um, I read in a magazine that your uh, tape was originally going to be called, um, like, Shred in Secrecy? Mm, huh? No. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> what? Shred? Trading in secret, secret, secrecy or something like that. No. But you opted to call the album simply Metallica. Why is that? Well, I'm shorter. Yeah. <laughs> Easier to remember. <laughs> oh, it's a good band name. I, no. I mean, we just wanted to get away from some of the, um... Some of the, you know, sort of heavy metal cliches and having, you know, ten word album titles and all that. You know, who can have the, the most sideways thing in word place and all that kind of thing. It just seemed to be getting a little old, so we just thought we'd make it short and sweet Metallica, you know? Thank you, Shane, for calling short and sweet. Now we're going to move to New London, Connecticut. <laughs> That's the next album title. Yeah, that would be good. <laughs> Nancy, how are you? Welcome to Rockline. How you doing, guys? Hey. Hello. All right. I just, just want to tell you guys I think you're great, and, um... I love you guys. I love James, and I miss Cliff and everyone. Okay. And we my miss question you too. is, um, I know um, in Jason Newstead's first band, Rodson and Jetson, he wrote all the lyrics just about for the whole album, and I was just wondering why he only helped write um, the one song, My Friend of Misery. Was there a reason? <laughs> Uh, well. uh, you want to handle that one? <laughs> uh, well, I think you're better at handling this one. Jason, Jason, Jason. Jason's new stuff seemed to be a little more um, like the Justice album, a little more progressive, um, a little faster, a little more sideways, and it just seemed like the stuff that me and James and Kirk were writing was a little simpler, a little bouncier, and so on. We just wanted to try and kind of stick to that. So um, my friend of Misery, Jason, wrote this bass line, and we kind of wrote a whole song around it. There you go. Nancy brought off Cliff as well, and this is the first Metallica album without any kind of Cliff Burton contribution. Was that sort of sad, the end of an era? Oh, God. Sorry, it came up. <laughs> came no, up. I mean, to be totally honest with you, we don't really think of it like that anymore. When Cliff comes up in conversations now, it's usually we laugh at him for being late or, you know, for just some of the sillier things about him. It, you know, we never really sit around and go, oh, Cliff, yeah. you know, I mean, obviously we, I think we think like that more inside ourselves when we're alone, but when we talk about him, you know, within the band, it just, you know, we laugh and we think of the good times and, and it's just like, but you got to understand that Jason's been in the band almost five years now and he's been in the band about a year and a half longer than Cliff has and even though people still think of him as a new guy, it's like he's actually, you know, he's a... We're used to having them around, so. I guess after five and a half years, you would get used to yeah. it. Thanks for the call, Nancy. Well, that Jason was a good one. <laughs> actually getting tired of it. We've got Mike on the line from St. Louis, Missouri. Go ahead, Mike. You're on. Hey, what's going on, guys? Hey, Mike. Uh, I really wanted to commend you guys on the success of your new album. It uh, really shows how you guys have grown musically. Uh, got two questions for you. Uh, do you realize that the widespread of bootleg CDs and video that have been distributed throughout the country since the Justice album, and how do you yes. feel about that? Yes, really? There's a, there's a, at least 150 to 200 bootleg albums alone. I, when we were out in Europe, I remember seeing a magazine that had an article on all the bootleg albums that we'd ever put out. And I, I, there's tons and tons and tons of bootleg albums. Can't even keep up with them anymore. I mean, and, and also, a, a lot of times these companies will take the same bootleg album and package it differently and put it in, with, in a different sleeve with to yeah. totally different artwork. And it's just... Or it's even worse, sometimes there's been a couple bootlegs. So, you know, Metallica has a song titles, and you put it on, and it's like some demo from some band you never heard of. Oh, you know? really? Yeah. yeah. Different artists handle that differently. Yeah. I know Bob Dylan has his people go out and confiscate any tape recorders they see, as opposed to the Grateful Dead, who say, here's the taping yeah, section. Yeah. How do you we handle actually, it? We actually, on the, um, a couple of gigs on the last tour, we had what was called the taper section, which oh. is like up behind the mixing board. You actually like can buy a ticket and you encourage the kids to come in and tape the show. Kind of, our that manager, Bay Area influence? Well, well I more, think our manager Cliff yeah, has a theory that, um, you know, we're the Grateful Dead for the 90s. Something like that. Come on. <laughs> that's that's squelch that. And, <laughs> and uh, I guess maybe it also makes us play better or whatever, but I don't think that theory really works. Mm, <laughs> but, uh, Grateful on the Dead tour, for the on 90s. The, on tour you that we heard have, it here. <laughs> on this tour that we have coming up, we have it at every show. So we're going to have this taper section at every show, so, you know, bring a tape recorder. You know, I, check I, it out. I mean, with bootleg albums, it's something that you can't really stop anyway, so 
And you, you can either approach it in a negative way or approach it in a, po a positive way. And you know, it's 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 a way of yeah. of uh, of uh, you know keeping everything going, even though yeah. you know approach it we don't really mind way. it as long as yeah. you get a copy of it. You know, <laughs> that's something to laugh copy. at. <laughs> <laughs> We've got Lisa on the line who's calling from Kinning, Pennsylvania. Hi, Lisa. Say hello to Kirk and Lars. Hi, hi guys. I'm really. Big fans of yours. We went to see you 13 times in the last. Oh my 13 God! We played 13 times. Seven different states, time. and we even flew out to California to see you guys. Your last Holy two shows out there. Was it worth it? Yes, yes, most <laughs> definitely. I have two questions. The first one's for Kirk. When oh, he sorry. records in a studio, does he stand up or sit down? And the second question is: In the beginning of Am I Evil, why does Kirk and James make that pyramid above their head? <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, the first. Oh, okay. that's heavy. Oh, that's heavy. Okay. Oh, that's heavy. Oh, that's heavy. oh, I can't wait to hear the answer. Uh, for this. Yeah, you familiar with the phrase? Some things should just be left alone. No, they're <laughs> not going to be left alone like, today. We, went, we should have had a meeting about this. Uh, before. I'm okay, I mean, should have been here to answer <laughs> yeah. that one. That's, that's a, definitely a James question. Okay, let's but, get I these mean, two questions again. Uh, oh yeah, g getting to your first question. Uh, a lot of times I, I, I sit down in the studio and play, and when I'm really excited about playing a, a certain thing or a certain passage, sometimes I'll, I'll sit up, or you know, Not very often. But yeah, which, is, <laughs> which is only once, maybe. But uh, or or if I'm if I'm using a wah pedal, I'll stand up. But which is usually, very often. usually I sit down. <laughs> yeah. Usually I sit down. As as for the pyramid thing, yeah, I that's just, just that's something we can't talk about. It's a, uh, it's oh, we also I use it. I think the question was directed at Kirk Lars. Yes. yes. Oh, she's me, going. I'm, 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 I'm afraid that if you say something we oh, can't talk about, we won't yours. get the answer. <laughs> go ahead, Kirk. But uh, I mean, uh, I mean, it's also a cue to go into the next part. How's that? Is that a safe enough answer? No. Oh. <laughs> What's the real story? Uh, it just got such a big reaction. There has to be. I, 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 I never knew that anyone noticed. Yeah. It's a I mean, real inside thing. Yeah, it's an I mean, inside thing. It's best joke. not to talk about it on yeah. TV. Oh, I tried. It's, it's, it's just a silly <laughs> male thing, you know. <laughs> okay, but well. Uh, let me give you a hint. If, when, James comes, when James, James comes on yeah. here, you should ask him because he has a real answer. Yeah. Okay, Lisa, that's what we'll do when James <laughs> okay. comes on. A call back. Orlando, Florida. Joey, welcome to the show, Joey. Say hi and ask your question, which hopefully we'll get an answer to. Hey, you guys are the greatest band in the world, I swear. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm Thank wondering, you. are you guys going to make more videos and like release more singles from this album, or do you like, are you guys like afraid that people will think you're selling out if you do? Because you like you have <laughs> in the past a lot. Um, well, we're definitely yeah. putting out more singles and making more videos. Yeah. As a matter of fact, we just uh, made a new video for The Unforgiven about four weeks ago. We're over here playing the MTV Awards, and uh, it should. Uh, premiere on your channel if you guys are interested in having it in Excellent. about three or four weeks. That will and, make um, a total of three. Three <laughs> videos. Ooh, We're going to talk a little bit more about the Unforgiven video, uh, the B-side, which I believe features some interesting backup vocals. We have a toll-free number here, 1-800-344-ROCK, and that's 344-7625. Our guests are Kirk Hammett and Lars Ulrich of Metallica. Welcome back. It's Rockline on MTV, and my guests are Lars Ulrich and Kirk Hammett of, Meta Hammett of Metallica. If you have a question, the number is toll-free 1-800-344-ROCK. We were talking about videos before the break, and you've just made a new one. Do you like making videos? I'm starting to like it, yeah. <clears throat> it was a bit weird, because you understand that we spent like eight years not making videos, and it was just like... It was this big evil that we sort of kept away from, and then what all, is that? I don't know. I think we just never felt that it was something that we needed to get what we're doing across to people and so on. And I think in the early years, it was like sort of the marketing plan with bands. You know, you have your art, you know, your pretty boy looks and your photographs, and here's the video, and here's this whole marketing thing, and we just kind of wanted to stay away from that. And so eight years later, Peter Mensch walks into our dressing room, who's our manager, and said, you know, in Paris a couple of years ago, he said, let's do a video for the song One, and we're like, huh? Eh? <laughs> and uh, after, you know, a couple hours, he actually talked us into it. It was pretty cool doing that. We did one for Sam, man, which was pretty fun, and I'm actually starting to really dig it. Now, the B-side of the single for The Unforgiven is what? In what country? <laughs> in America? Oh, yeah, it's different everywhere. Well, everywhere. isn't there... Yeah. In America, it's a song called Killing Time. 
which is uh, a song that was done by this band called Sweet Savage, which Vivian Campbell, who was in White Snake for about five minutes, that was his first band, and it's a song that we used to play in the real early days when we were just playing the clubs around L.A. with Dave Mustaine and so on. And Kirk, are you singing backup vocals on the track? Yes, I am. Ha is that the first time that you've done any singing on Metallica? <laughs> no, actually, I, I, I've done backup vocals on other albums. It's just that this time it was just me for once. And it, we went to, to do the vocals in, in a, uh, a studio in Holland. Was it Holland? Holland. Yeah, it was Holland. And... Um, we were gonna do backup vocals the way we always do them, which is like a bunch of us. And uh, it didn't work out, and then we tried it with, with just Jason, and that didn't work out, and we tried it with just myself, and it worked, so. Great. So yeah. in the U.S., that's what the B-side is. Uh, Mike, I believe, has a question about The Unforgiven, who's calling from Blythe, California. Welcome to the show, Mike. What's your, what's your question? Hi, Martha. Hi. I love what you're doing with the show. I think it's great. Thank you. How you guys doing? We're, okay. we're all right. I think you're know. hard, man. It's like, it's real cool, man. I was wondering about um, my favorite song like, on, on the album is The Unforgiven. And uh, how'd you guys come up with the concept for that? Um, good question. How did we come up with that? Um, we'd written about, I think, 10 songs. And James had this one other kind of melodic, subdued piece that we're kind of talking about. Maybe it should just be like a little instrumental piece. And I suggested to him that it just had a really cool vibe to it that maybe we should turn it into a song. So I wanted to do a ballad that was different from all the other ballads that we've done, which is usually like, you know, kind of subdued verses and a real heavy chorus. So we kind of flipped that around and did like a heavy verse and a kind of mellow chorus, and that turned into The Unforgiven. I'm just sitting here looking at you guys <laughs> thinking, 600,000 albums right off the bat. What is that mm. like? Did you expect that, first of all? Of course. No, I'm you didn't. I'm just kidding. <laughs> he did. <laughs> yeah, I did. I did. I expected 700,000. Well, <laughs> but let's talk about what the real plan was. <laughs> no, I think we all had an idea that the first week was going to be, you know, pretty good, you know, and, and because obviously we have some really dedicated fans out there and we knew that you know, everybody, we were trying to get the release date out to people, August 12th, blah, blah, blah. So we knew that the first few days were going to be pretty serious, but the way that it kind of is still six weeks later, it was number one for four weeks, it just kept hanging on and on, just really blew everybody away, really, big time. How do you maintain your fans' dedication? <laughs> well, yeah. Just by being ourselves. Yeah, I, mean, I mean, you try and not let stuff like that, just you know, try not to think about it too much. It's like, what was good about the situation was that we were on tour over in Europe, and it was like being removed from it over there. You know, we're sitting in hotel rooms in Italy and, you know, Budapest and all these far out places, just getting faxes from our office saying, you know, number one, and here are the figures. And in, in a way, it just seemed like really kind of distant and unreal. And I think it was good for us that way, because if we'd been in America at the time, you know, <laughs> yeah. it might have kind of hit us in a different way. So I think it was real healthy that way. Well, let's see what Dave thinks. Dave's calling from what does Dave think? Will 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 Dave, did you buy the record yet? He stole it. Dave? Hi, Dave. Speak. Dave, did you buy the album yet? Yeah. See? One of 600,000 right here. How you doing? Welcome to the show. Ask your question. Pretty good. We're hanging out, you know, rapping, you know, with Martha. Right. Well, Speak. Okay. <laughs> Say something. <laughs> About, um, what do you think of Dave Mustaine and his success with Megadeth, and are y'all still friends? Um, yeah. I mean, it was weird for a while, because, you know, there was a lot of of weird things going on in the press between us and Mustaine for a couple of years and I think that it was just you know Dave was kind of bitter I mean it wasn't like the sweetest of breakups and um, you know but he has a great band and he's uh, made some records that I really like and um, when I see him when I'm in LA I call him up once in a while we hang out and so on he's been uh, so you do it. still socialize with oh, him? Oh yeah, we see him. It's not like you know, I, it's not like he comes and stays at my house, you know, months at a time. But uh, we hang out when we're in LA, and he's you know been kind of cleaning himself up and stuff like that the last year. So he doesn't like socialize in the way that we used to. <laughs> and um, so I don't see as much of him as I used to. But you know, Dave's fine, and uh, you know a lot of that stuff that went on in the press for a couple of years that was just silly. And I think. Both of us are kind of over Kirk, didn't he now. come up and say something to you at one point at the Clash of the Titans tour? Where do you guys get your information? I, I, I never told anyone. From me. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, it, it was really unusual because, like, uh, I was standing there, and, you know, I'm, I'm always you know, polite about it. I go, hey, Dave, how you doing? And he goes, hey, how you doing? And uh, he, he said, uh, 
she basically just came up to me and, and apologized yeah. for all the bad mouthing that he he did to to me and 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 the band and uh, you know I was really surprised and um, I think that that was a that was a, a result of you know him cleaning up and actually being able to think with a clear head. Cool. And, you know, must have felt good to have that resolved a bit. Yeah, you know, it, I thought it was you know, very decent of him. Good. You're watching Rockline on MTV. Kirk Hammett, Lars Ulrich are in the studio. Please stay with us. We only have one more segment. Oh no. We will be back. Oh, I'm I know. Welcome back. This is Rockline on MTV. If you have a question for either, either Lars or Kirk, please late. call us. <laughs> We're here too late. No, they're not. 1-800-344-ROCK, and that's 344-7625. If your call gets on the air, you'll receive a box of 10 Sony Metal SR audio cassettes, as well as 100 frequent buyer points redeemable for great stuff like a Sony Watchman, and it's all courtesy oh of God. Sony Recording Media. Now, the first time anybody heard Metallica was <coughs> at a little party in New York. York City. Tell me about that. And where was this little party? Oh, was it the Cat Club? <laughs> What's that thing well, then you call? That that one place that uh, uh, that other band played. That other really huge band that they made a movie of. Anyway, Zeppelin. That band. Madison Square Garden. We just we just decided to have a, a, a listening party for a few close friends, and uh, you know it got. A little bit bigger than we thought it, it'd turn out. <laughs> no, it's a lot of fun. It worked out really well. And Jason tried to go out into the crowd. I think he oh. actually succeeded. No, I, I, I think we out. all went out into the crowd. Did you? Did you? I didn't go out. Uh, I, was I did. hiding in the I was, closet. I was, <laughs> <laughs> I was uh, out amongst the fans, oh. and, I, I, and the lights were down. And I saw this guy sitting in a wheelchair, and I tapped him on, on the soldier, and he looked at me, at me and he like, kind of oh, wow. jumped. And I said, how do you like the album? And he goes, oh, it's great. And then I walked off and I looked behind him. He was like following me. <laughs> oh. And then, you know, it got bigger and bigger. And so I had to get that out was, of there. That was interesting. It was what? just weird just walking around like the corridors of Madison Square Garden and like your album's playing up there and there's like 10,000 people sitting up there. And it's like, it was really uncomfortable. I was more nervous that day than I've ever been for anything else with was, Metallica. It was, was weird. Nervous. What an weird. amazing event. Listening cool. party at Madison Square Garden. Bill is calling from Phoenix, Arizona. Hi, Bill. Welcome Ooh. to the show. Hi, how's it going? It's going good. Hey, how you doing, Bill? Um, yeah, I was just wondering. I liked your uh, Garage Days Revisited, the first one. And um, I was just wondering if you're ever going to come out with another one. Uh, well, we actually did. See, there's a twi trick thing in there. Because yeah. the first one was the B-side of a European single that, uh, like, Creeping Death or something, like, in 84. And the second one, the second Garage Days Revisited, was the one that came out as the 598 EP. So will we do a third one? Um, uh, not the next few days. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, that pretty much was a spontaneous event yeah. anyway. I mean, it, it wasn't something that we had planned months in advance to do. It was uh, something that we, we put out because that year, was 87? Yeah, it was, we, we, yeah, we were playing a Castle Donington sh a gig in, in London and also two other gigs in Germany, and we wanted to put out something. Yeah some sort of product so that the, that uh, it would tie in with those shows. And when Electra found out about it, they decided, you know, yeah. you know let's, <laughs> let's get, a, get, a, get a part of this. <laughs> and uh, they released it in the States, and that's how that all came about. But, you know, if you want more kind of silly B-sides and stuff like that, a lot of the um, other cassette singles that are coming out all have, like, unreleased cover songs on the B-sides, like the one Killing Time we were just talking about. and. The next couple of singles have some more, like just silly cover songs from the cool. early '80s and stuff. So cool. for that's Metallica where most collectors, of that stuff shows up now. Definitely. Yeah. So thank you for the call. And now we're going to go on to Belle Vernon, Pennsylvania. We'll say hello to Shawneen. Hi, Shawneen. Guys. Hello. Hello. I just wanted to say that you guys are phenomenal, <laughs> and I can't wait to see you in Pittsburgh when you guys come. Thank you. Pittsburgh. Right. Yeah. Did you buy a ticket yesterday? Yes, I okay. did. Because it went on sale yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> Shawnee, do you have a question? I'm nervous. <laughs> Anyways, I was wondering if you guys could give me like some insight into the stage setup for the concert. Oh, God. I was waiting for that. Absolutely not. Okay, Kurt, well, I'll tell you the whole story, <laughs> then I'll give you all the dirt. <laughs> um, 
What do you want to know? Where'd you go? Um, it's a stage. It's um, pretty different from it's, what anybody's ever seen it's before. Am, it's ambitious. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's uh, it's not theatrical. It's um, it's pretty clean, but it, what's different about it has more to do with like the setup and the configuration within the arena. I think it, the best way of saying it is probably that, like basically every song that we play is going to be a different setup. You know, like you go to a gig and it's like the stage is at one end of the arena and the singer's in the middle and the drummer's behind him and the guitar player's to the left and there's your sort of configuration for the evening. We threw that way out the door. And so the whole gig is just going to be different configurations all over the stage that's got a shape that is uh, pretty different from what you've seen You just have 500 before. roadies going out with you. <laughs> it's definitely giving our, our, our roadies a, yeah. a big headache. I mean, it, the big the, yeah. <laughs> the, the stage... <laughs> This, They're it, finally working. Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry, this, sorry. The stage. We love you guys. The stage show is definitely designed with a, a fan's point of view in mind. It just enables us to get a lot closer to the fans than than they've than we've ever had before, and it's going to be. Yeah, it's going to be very different. I'll guarantee pretty, uh, you that. And also, yeah. it's not. I'll say this: the stage is not in the middle of the arena, so it's not like us in the round. Yeah. But every seat around us, even behind us, is just as good a seat as anywhere else. You can see the whole show from anywhere in the arena. We're selling all the way around, but we're not playing in the middle, so you figure it out. You know? All right, so we know <laughs> tickets went on sale yesterday in Pittsburgh and October 29th, I think you go out on your tour. Yeah, we start yeah. in Peoria. Well, Scott, you have the honors and the unfortunate task, actually, for all of us to be the last phone caller. So Scott is calling from Quincy, this Massachusetts. Fun. I know. Yeah, we're just warming up to this. <laughs> I know. Go ahead, Scott. What's your, what's your question? My question is, well, first of all, I'd like to say that you guys are the greatest metal band ever created on the face of the earth. Oh, well, that's that's uh, big. Well, Checks I'd in like the mail. Say, <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. Thanks. I'd like to ask you guys that uh, when you guys decided to change producers and go to Bob Rock, what made you guys change it since you had a lot of success with your other producers on your other album? Okay, I just have to say one thing. We have about 45 seconds. So give us the short the answer. Short version, uh, uh, we like it was like Tyler's change. Okay. Tyler's <laughs> right quick. We like the sound of his name. Right. Yeah. Great name. You can throw in the Molly Crew thing. thing. Like we have time. <laughs> no, I mean it. It was his time to try something different. You know, Fleming, the guy that did the last three records, was not really that much of a producer, and I think we just felt that it was time to let somebody in on, on just kind of what was going on within the studio and try and push some things out of us and, and, and whatever. You, you've heard it all before anyway. <laughs> yeah, but, well, thank you so much for being here. October 12th, day on the green curtain right. in uh, the Bay Area, hometown area. So that's it, this edition of Rockline. Next week, uh, Paula Abdul will be here. See you then. Flies by.